This is a presentation I put together, oh, about six months ago for a community where I now live. There were a bunch of people from out of the, out of the state, uh, some out of the country, who moved into this retirement home and wanted to know about Seattle history, and they wanted to know about the cleanup of Lake Washington. They'd heard about it, didn't know what it meant. So on that basis, I put together this presentation. I talked with Laura about getting a couple documents that are used in here, as you'll see as we go along. But it's a discussion of what happened in this area in the, in the mid-1950s to uh, recognize and uh, document the fact that environmental protection was important to us. Long before there was a Clean Water Act, long before there was NEPA or SEPA, it was an environmental ethic that this community had and still has, as evidenced by some of the things we've heard here this morning. So let me go ahead. The problems. Uh, Lake Washington was being fertilized. You probably heard all this, and some of this is maybe redundant for you, but uh, permit me to go ahead. Uh, it became totally unsuitable for, for recreation, and the waters of Puget Sound, Elliott Bay, and the shorelines around it were uh, foul. And I won't show pictures, but they were foul. Uh, there were 11 treatment plants discharging in Lake Washington, all using the highest possible treatment capacity or treatment processes available at that time, secondary treatment. Uh, the Washington Lake, <clears throat> the effluent contained phosphorus and nitrogen, fertilized the growth of algae, and uh, we found that there were oscillatory rubescens, algae being developed, and that's a, that was recognized by everyone as a telltale sign of, a, of a lake deterioration. Uh, Dr. Edmondson, Tommy Edmondson at UW, limnologist, uh, warned that the lake would be lost as a recreational asset if we didn't do something. He used the fern term doomed. Um, he cited similar experiences in Europe, primarily Lake Zurich in, in uh, Switzerland, where the same problem had existed and it had been solved by basically the same techniques we used here. Uh, the problem in the lake was that the algae bloomed. They, they were plants. They bloomed in huge numbers. Uh, when all the nutrients were used up, then they died. And they washed ashore in windrows. I mean, literally windrows of dead algae and dead plants die, they, they, they decay, and they smell. And uh, the lake had truly become a liability. 1950, a, a secchi disc, those of you involved in the field work here know what a secchi disc is. It could be seen in 12 feet of water in the lake. By 1955, it disappeared in 30 inches of water. This is a secchi disc here, just a, a um, black and white disc. You drop it in the water until it disappears, and tell how cloudy the water is. Uh, Elliott Bay and Puget Sound were a worst case. You know, most of the, the discussions about Metro success talk about, Elliott, or talk about Lake Washington. The real problems that we had here, not that Lake was, was not a problem, it was, but the real hideous problems were in, in the Duwamish River and, and the Lake, or Elliott Bay waterfront along the waterfront around the uh, Elliott, excuse me, Alki Point and whatnot. Uh, Waters that would have polluted Lake Washington have been diverted into uh, the Duwamish, Elliott Bay, and uh, the last outfall into, raw sewage outfall into the Lake Washington was diverted in 1941. Problem in, the, in these waters was that 70 million gallons of raw sewage was emptied into these waters. 61 outfalls had to be uh, identified, were identified, and ultimately eliminated. Salmon runs in the Duwamish were uh, threatened because of low dissolved oxygen or zero dissolved oxygen in some places and water contact was literally banned in any saltwater beach in the region. This is the outfall, or the end of the, as you well know probably, at least, I guess it's buried, no, you can't see it. This is the end of the West Point, uh, end of the North Trunk Sewer, 12 foot diameter line that discharged uh, on the beach during high flows. And this is an indication of the condition that some people found themselves working in. This is what it looked like, there was a 42 inch line that ran out about a thousand feet into the water and raw sewage then created this plume which varied in direction depending on the tides. And you can see the first construction for West Point there, the, the uh, sand that had been dredged up on, in behind the breakwater. Some of the construction work was done, uh, tough, tough construction uh, and tunneling and whatnot. All sewage generated in downtown Seattle on the first hill, Capitol Hill and uh, uh, Beacon Hill were discharging Elliott Bay without treatment until the 1960s. The Elliott Bay waterfront was, uh, I call it, foul and disgusting. 
some indication of some of the outfalls. 1950s, though, I'm going back to my introductory comments, the League of Women Voters and the Municipal League actually demanded clean waters. It was a, pro a situation that couldn't go any further, and they demanded that we find a solution. A young attorney, young at the time, uh, Jim Ellis uh, drafted legislation that would give King County charter authority to solve the problem. Uh, the voters disapproved that particular effort. So the leagues uh, convened a what they called the Metropolitan Study Committee, and uh, again, with support from the leagues, Jim drafted legislation that would allow the legislature to uh, create a Metropolitan Municipal Corporation if the voters approved it, a metro. Uh, here's Jim. He's still active, still writing his uh, memoirs. Uh, the book now is, I don't know how many volumes, but it takes up this much shelf space in a three different shelves. <laughs> he, he keeps claiming he's going to reduce it in volume. Uh, I think that'll be the harder part. In 1957, the legislature passed the enabling legislation that allowed the creation of Metro. It's interesting that Dan Evans, then a freshman legislator in the, in the House of Representatives, passed the deciding vote on the last day of the legislative session, particularly important and significant because this legislation passed the year it was introduced. It almost never happens in Olympia. So the citizens' action uh, allowed the creation of a Metro, if the voters approved, with six different functions. It could be uh, area-wide planning, parks and parkways, uh, water pollution control, water supply, transit, and solid waste management. Uh, the opponents, and there were several, uh, the extreme political, uh, I'll call them conservatives, uh, we have some around the country today, uh, an east side developer who remained nameless, uh, the John Burt Society, a uh, rent attorney named Nick Mafia, I'll come back to him in a minute, a consulting engineer, Howard ha Harstad, who had a number of clients whose projects might have been influenced by the creation of a metro, and the suburban mayors during the first vote, which occurred in April of 58. This was a poster, poster sign that was posted all around the community. Uh, the five kids there were the kids of Dorothy Block, one of the uh, uh, influential leaders in the community. So we talk about politics now. Let's take a few minutes about that. It's an important part of this whole process. Uh, to create a metro, the vote had to pass aggregately in the suburbs, taken together, and in the city of Seattle. Two different tests. Uh, the first proposal, uh, with three different functions, transit, area-wide planning, and water pollution control, uh, passed in the city of Seattle, but not in the suburbs, primarily because of the opposition from the, from the suburban mayors. Uh, politics at work again. Uh, you could call it gerrymandering if you want, but it saved Lake Washington. Uh, concluded that saving the lake was important, created a boundary that was basically all that uh, area that drained directly to the lake and limited the functions to water pollution control and put the ba ballot on, uh, vote up on the ballot in September of 58. Uh, suburban mayors, as I said, had opposed the uh, creation of Metro the first time and their primary argument was valid, was that facilities that were they had built and still had debt to pay on were going to be abandoned and they are going to be stuck with the uh, with the outstanding debt and, and the facilities would be abandoned. Uh, Seattle Mayor Clinton, Gordon Clinton at the time, suggested that perhaps Metro, when, if it was created, should pay for the outstanding debt of all these communities whose facilities were going to be abandoned. Uh, he had the idea, but being a great politician, he was persuaded to let Byron Bagley, by Bagley and Kirkland, take credit for the reimbursement idea. Uh, he, suburban mayor, uh, influential in suburban mayors. Uh, he convinced his colleagues to support the organization creation and it passed by 58 percent in the city of Seattle and 67 percent in the suburbs. So we had, a, we had an organization. It had a debt from day one because it had to pay for the election uh, and of course it obligated to pay for several million dollars in facilities that was ultimately uh, abandoned. But the Metro Council when it was first formed uh, included the mayor of Seattle, seven Seattle council members, two county commissioners, uh, an appointee from the county, uh, the mayor of Bellevue and the mayor of Renton because of the size of those two communities at the time, a representative of the small cities, and a chairperson. They, they acted very rapidly. Uh, the election was in, in uh, September 58. First meeting of the council was in October 6th, I think it was, uh, 1958, and they selected Carrie Donworth. Uh, as chairman and uh, Jim, retained Jim Ellis 
as the council. Uh, they appointed the first executive director in, in March of 59. I followed him two months later in May of 59. Uh, the engineering consortium uh, to do the work for us was retained in June of 59. The comprehensive sewerage plan was adopted in July of 59. And uh, <laughs> preparation. <laughs> And the preparation pre-design report and the financing plan was authorized in July. Now well, that was moving, and that was the, the uh, speed at which, which we tried to finish the whole project on, and we did largely. Okay, the plan, $125 million in 1960 dollars, uh, 10 year schedule, uh, eliminate discharges to the lake in eight, six and a half years, and those into the salt water in eight and a half years. That was our goal. This was the plan, this is what Laura got for me, and I do thank you for that. This is what it looked like. This was the fold out, if you will, of the Metropolitan Seattle Sewerage and Drainage Study, which was completed by Brown and Caldwell in 1957. Four new treatment plants, uh, incorporation of Seattle's new alkali plant into the, uh, into the plan, 110 miles of new interceptors, uh, including 10 miles of tunnels, dozens of pumping stations, uh, and the rehab of 20 miles of old large diameter brick sewers that had been built in 1910 and 1914 under the direction of R.H. Thompson. Uh, the groundbreaking at Renton occurred in uh, July of 61. Small plants were completed uh, in 1962. The Renton plant was dedicated in 65, dedicated in the memory of Hal Miller, our first executive director who had passed away in 64. West Point was dedicated in 66. Last discharge into the lake in 67, and raw sewage discharges along the Duwamish and Elliott Bay were eliminated in 1970. Picture of the groundbreaking uh, at Renton, uh, Molly Boone, our receptionist, with Harold Hal Miller holding her hand, great man, uh, simultaneous degrees in engineering and psychology from Purdue, and a four-year letterman in track. <laughs> and with them is Mayor Dorm Brayman. The Renton plant, as it neared completion at that time, we call it Renton then, you call it South now, of course. Uh, work at West Point, uh, moving a lot of sand, building uh, influent pipelines to divide the flow to get to the screens. Uh, con during construction, doesn't look like that now, of course. <laughs> but our goal was do better than promised. Hal Miller made us uh, believe in that, and we did. Uh, we carried that uh, slogan, if you will, uh, mantra uh, through the whole program. Uh, we had a proposed sewer service charge of 250 a month, which was we were told to the electorate when they voted. Uh, we did it for two dollars a month for the first eight years. Uh, we completed the work 18 months ahead of schedule, and we ended up within one percent of the original cost estimate, even at, after adding 20 million dollars to the program. The results: Secchi Disc. Uh, could be visible over 20 feet in the lake and it increased over 25 feet a little later. This was in 1960 or 1970. Uh, the dangerous, dangerous algae were gone. Uh, the saltwater beaches reopened. Salmon runs in the Duwamish were no longer threatened. Uh, the Elliott Bay waterfront became noted as one of the cleanest in the country. And uh, it was recognized nationally and in some cases internationally as one of the most successful pollution control programs uh, at the time. Waldo Dahl was uh, director, or excuse me, as chairman of the Park Board, City of Seattle. He took great delight in burning the, the uh, polluted water sign at Carkeek Park. <laughs> <laughs> and kids could enjoy Lake Washington again. And the block kids, this is a bad, bad shot on my part, uh, I'd cropped it the wrong way, but anyway, here are the five block kids whose picture were, was the poster for the work in the first place, celebrating after 30 years. We did a lot of innovation things. I, I was proud of that. Uh, we found a way, we, we actually had to find a way for tunnelers to work in safer conditions in, in tunnels. And we developed new compre compressed air regulations for tunneling work that resulted in the fact that we had no lost time injuries and no claims for injuries from any of the tunnel work. We had, uh, I think, one of the first computer control programs for remote valves and pumps. Uh, 
We reduced combined sewage overflows by using in-system storage. This was a time before anybody talked about removing anything from uh, eliminating CSOs. This was in 1970, 71. It wasn't even in the, in the jargon, certainly not in any legislation at the time. Uh, we had automatic real-time water quality monitoring along the Duwamish so we knew what was happening in the river after we had put the Renton effluent into the river and that water quality data provided the information needed for later for Metro and then King County to remove that effluent and take it out past Duwamish Head. And we found ways to do deep trenching without uh, <laughs> subsurface or surface subsidence. You weren't here then, but the first contract for the Renton or the east side interceptor was from the Renton plant through the city of Renton. Uh, the contractor at that time, General Construction as I recall, decided to dewater the area, and, uh, which they did, and of course most of Renton settled at the time. Uh, plant, buildings were settled, Puget Power lost uh, quite a bit of a, of a maintenance facility. It was a big mess and uh, litigation went on for some time. The next contractor, PAMCO, uh, the next section north going past the Boeing plant decided they didn't want to dewater that area and lose anything at Boeing, so they developed a process of uh, driving sheet piles, cofferdam cough, all the way around the work site in segments, uh, pouring a concrete seal in there and then dewatering the hole. And it didn't touch the ground around it, it worked beautifully and that was the process used uh, thereafter for all of our deep trenching. Uh, we used a lot of very, very large caissons who, to uh, drop pumping stations into place. Uh, we installed uh, 10 miles of hollow 48-inch diameter beams uh, to carry sewage from Kenmore to, uh, to uh, Matthews Park and from Issaquah into uh, Vassa Park. These were be basically just hollow beams. And we pioneered the use of biosolids for forest sewer culture. This was a study we did along with the University of Washington that demonstrated that biosolids would work to improve growth patterns and, uh, and tree growth in the uh, forest. They did that down at their packed forest site. This is not the pipeline we used in the lake. This is, done, this is a uh, pipe that was installed for, for uh, Georgia Pacific, but that's the concept that was used for the lake line. This is the caisson that was built for the uh, Lake City pumping station, 120 by 60, the biggest one anybody had de developed around here, maybe, maybe in the country at the time. We dropped it about 70 feet, I think it was, 70 or 80 feet from the surface. At one point, the uh, excavation inside the caisson got quite a bit ahead of the uh, cutting shoes, and the whole thing dropped about six feet, bang. And it was recorded on the seismographs at the University of Washington. <laughs> Scared the heck out of everybody. The only damage was that a uh, little uh, tractor in there had the uh, exhaust pipe damaged by a cross beam that hit it, fortunately. So the way the plant looked, or the pumping station looked at completion, uh, you've, any of you have been down there, you know it's a huge facility. And here's a picture of yours truly when I had hair, uh, <laughs> looking down on some of the uh, equipment in the pump station. This is one of my, one of two, three, I guess, projects I actually worked on the design. On. I was a project engineer, not project manager, on the Lake City pump station. Fascinating job. We did a lot of work on the old lines as indicated. This is, I think, a shot at, at Dexter Avenue where the, the old Lake City, excuse me, the old <coughs> North Trunk sewer reduced down in size to a smaller line uh, with an outfall into Lake Union. And we built the uh, Dexter Avenue regulator station. Case on it at, uh, where was this one? Anyway, another pump station case. Uh, a lot of accolades were received by the organization, by the program, and by the community. Uh, we were given an All-American City Award in 1959. We hadn't done a thing yet, but it was, a rec <laughs> it was recognition of what the citizens had done to provide the, the impetus to allow us to clean up the lake. Uh, we had the <clears throat> President's Council of Environmental Quality mention the project in their first uh, annual report. Uh, the Washington Post, Harper's Magazine, Leggy's Home Journal, Time, U.S. News, National Geographic, ACE, ASCE, APWA, and the National Association of Clean Water Agencies all recognized the project as being truly remarkable. So why do we succeed? Primarily because the citizens had an environmental ethic. The whole region has an environmental ethic. Had one then, still does. Keep in mind, this was done before there was, a, as I said, before there was any uh, legislation, there was a mild 
effort on the part of the state to uh, get the matter uh, resolved, but it wasn't hardly, it wasn't pushed real hard. Citizen Action did it. Uh, keep in mind, too, that there was a council, Metro Council made a commitment to get the job done. They told the staff, told us, uh, you have our support, get the job done, just don't create any problems for us. And that's how we operated for 10 years. Uh, interesting, too, that Seattle subsidized the whole system for the first 10 or more years. 75% of the revenue derived from sewer service charges came from the city of Seattle, and yet well over half the money was going to be spent outside the city of Seattle in the first years. And so I think that's a, a testament to statesmanship and political acumen on the part of the council at that time, recognizing that they couldn't solve the Lake Washington problem unless they supported this particular project, and if they had to subsidize it to do it, so be it. We had outstanding legal and engineering advice, and we had a mission commitment from the staff. That's what did it. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Anything? People have questions? I've saturated you. <laughs> yes? I was wondering if you could give us a little more background about you personally and how you heard about the project and first got involved and, you know, what your career progression was. Oh. Well, I was working for the State and Police Control Commission, a forerunner of the Department of Ecology. <clears throat> Started there in 1956, I guess it was. Um, we had a, a director at the time who was nationally recognized, and, but he was on the wrong side of the political spectrum at the time and was asked to leave. Uh, a fellow who was at the time uh, chairman of the, of the Liquor Control Board was appointed to be our director, uh, which was an interesting combination. Uh, <laughs> but he was, he was a politician. He left, lets us alone, let us do our job. Then, at, right after the uh, Sewage and drainage study was prepared, as I mentioned, here in the Seattle area, done by Hal Miller, led it by him, working for Brown Caldwell. <coughs> Excuse me. His work was done, and he applied for and was selected to be the executive director of the Pollution Control Commission. And uh, so that's where I got to know him. Worked on, under his direction there for about a year and a half, and then finally he was asked to come to Seattle and lead the Metro program. As he left Olympia, he said, would you like to come and work on the Metro project when I'm ready for you? And of course, that was like being an astronaut being asked to go to the moon or something like that. Hell yes, I will. Uh, <laughs> so he asked me to come up in June, or, I guess it was May of 59. So that's how I got started. I worked four days a week for Metropolitan Engineers, the consortium, and one day a week for him on special projects. And one of my first projects was to develop the water quality monitoring program and the industrial waste control program for Metro. Um, he also asked me to develop the uh, personnel policies and job descriptions for the treatment plant operators when they came on duty in 62. Uh, so it was a, a varied activity. Uh, he, uh, we had an, an assistant executive director at that time. His name was Fred Lange, a fellow who was, had worked for Brown and Caldwell on Brown and Caldwell projects, let's say, as a client down in California. Uh, he wanted to go back to his original em employer and spend enough time down there to get his retirement system set in place. So he left for about six months. Hal asked me to take over as assistant executive director at the time. So uh, when Fred came back, I went back to what I was doing. And then unfortunately Hal died, literally in my arms, in uh, 74. And uh, the council decided shortly after that that I should succeed Hal, but I had to be seasoned for a while. So I was uh, assistant executive director for two more years before I took over. So that was, that was how I got there. It was, a, it was a career made in heaven, it truly was. And uh, it served me very well later. I learned, I learned quite a bit here about how projects get put together and how politics work. And I managed to uh, develop a very large project in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that uh, was recognized in the uh, 70s and 80s as the, one of the primary success stories by EPA. And I learned that, uh, how important it was to involve the, the community in a project even though I was working for the consultants there, uh, that particular community had no environmental ethic, and uh, so we had to create our own environmental co uh, committees to uh, advise our council on what was important to it. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the career. I retired from CH2M Hill in 70, 60, wait a minute, 97, and uh, immediately was appointed to the, the board that uh, designed and built Safeco Field. I'm still on that board. 
kind of a checkered career. Yes. I was astonished by your presentation about how successful you were in terms of meeting the cost and exceeding your schedule for for the original yeah. plans. And aside from what was clearly a mission commitment, can you say anything about why why you were so successful in that way? Well, uh, we worked with the regulations that were in place at the time. It would be difficult to have that kind of a schedule met today with some of the uh, external obligations you have to meet here, clearly. Uh, but it was uh, great engineering, uh, great attention to detail, excellent plans and specifications. As I recall, we didn't have any claims for uh, the job, period, not, no legal action, not, other than the contractor who got in trouble in Renton. But that didn't involve us because it was his, his decision on uh, means and methods. But uh, the project was done in an environment where cooperation, communication was important and was followed to the letter. Uh, much later, people identified the process of project partnering, which has been developed around the country and really sponsored originally by a retired Corps of Engineer Colonel in Portland. But it's that process that gets people together and uh, basically forces them to agree to work together and not, not call each other names, and instead talk and communicate first. And that's what we did informally. We didn't know we were doing that, but that's what happened. But we had great contractors, um, and they, uh, they did the job. We didn't have any jobs run over on, on time. And uh, obviously, in the aggregate, we did pretty well on cost as well. Yeah, so, and maybe a follow-up on that on the cost side. How, I mean, it just seems amazing. I don't know how much detail you have had early on to come up with that cost estimate, but to, I mean, to come out right on target, it <laughs> yeah. just seems extraordinary. Well, I think it was, and probably some <laughs> luck involved too. But we had, as I said, we had great engineering work, and we had a lot of great geotechnical work ahead of time. We had our own geotechnical section, or the engineering consortium did, mm -hmm. and uh, they had great uh, uh, geotechnical reports that the contractors could rely on. And not that they were perfect, because no, no geotechnical report is, but we found ways to, uh, to get the job done. And one example, when they were drilling the, uh, the uh, tunnel from uh, Matthews Park down to uh, the freeway bridge over the ship canal, uh, ran into what the geologists call the glacial erratic, huge boulder right in the face of the tunnel, and occupied the entire face. And so they had to go in and drill it and blow it out and move ahead. But it was that kind of a problem. They knew how to fix it. They knew what to do. The compressed air regulations that we developed allowed men to, and well, no women. Women couldn't go in the tunnel then. Uh, but men to work in the tunnel and uh, feel comfortable that when they were finished their shift or finished their job, that they weren't going to be subjected to the, the Ben's disease and whatnot. And we had none of that problem, fortunately. We had to deal with state law when we started talking about tunnels. The state law at that time was patterned after the law that was used in New York City for sandhog work and required workers to come out of compressed air for lunch and go back under compressed air and work another four hours. And of course, it was a compression decompression problem, that uh, frequency that caused the problem with bends. So we got the high altitude medicine people from Boeing and the deep folks from uh, deep sea folks from the Navy, uh, several other folks, and had a two day seminar and demonstrated to the legislature and to the Department of Labor and Industries, that those laws had to be changed. So they repealed the laws, allowed uh, L and I to develop regulations, which we helped write, and it basically got the job done. Anything more? I, I have a question. Yes. The um, the breathtaking slide that you had there that uh, had the schedule, you know, the rapid succession of we formed, you know, we hired an executive director. Right. And I have a copy of the um, original 1958, you know, plan. It's yeah. a good two inches thick. Yeah. And so I'm blown away uh, by the delivery date for that plan, <laughs> and wanted to. And you know, the Brown and Caldwell right. mm -hmm. you know, report. And I'm curious if um, you know when work started on that, if you can remember, uh, and when it finished. So I recall the work was first. It was sponsored jointly by the state, the county, and the city. And most, mostly state money, as I recall. 
uh, and quite a bit of city money and some county money. I think it was $120,000 total. They started that in 56, I think, and fin finished it in 57, at least 57. Maybe it was 55, 56. Anyway, a two-year period, they got it done and uh, did some phenomenal uh, estimating work in there because mm -hmm. we did a pre-design report following that. That was one of the things we did to satisfy the bond buyers and uh, we refined the estimates then. It was the estimate of the pre-design report that we actually met. Yes? I wanted to hear from you a little bit about some of the factors that influenced the selection of the West Point treatment plant site as the site for the, the treatment plant and whether you looked at alternatives. <laughs> was, it, was it really a decision where you knew that was the site you had to go to? Or? It, was, it was the latter. We, the, the city had been plumbed, as it were. Uh, with the plumbing ending at, at West Point, 12-foot diameter pipe. And the West Point was an active Army Ford at the time, Fort Lawton. And so we didn't have to, we had to deal with one owner, and that was the U.S. Army. And their only requirement, when they recognized that there was political support for this project, their only requirement was that we relocate their heliport. Previously, they had used that little landing up above the treatment plant as their heliport. So they asked us to build a new helicopter facility, which we did up on the hill. It got them in trouble because they didn't run that, that appropriation through Congress, but it didn't involve us. And uh, that, <laughs> that was the cost. And there was basically no consideration of any other site at that time. And we had a similar site selection process, if I can use that term loosely, for the Renton plant. Uh, Chief Engineer from Metropolitan Engineers grabbed me one day and said, Tom, let's go find a site for the Renton plant. <laughs> So we stood up on a hill uh, looking down on the, on the, on the valley and uh, again realized that the pipeline to solve the Lake Washington problem was going to come through Renton and was going to head west after it left Renton and it was going to end somewhere down in that area. There was a golf course there, the Erlington Golf Course, uh, that looked like a likely site and so we got our, our ownership maps out and sketched out a site that we would have to buy and went, went about buying it. Very simple. <laughs> I don't envy you some of the site selection problems you have today. Yes? Do you sometimes use that photo of um, the woman in the pipe standing yeah. on the car? And you said you knew who they were, the yes. people in there. I'd yeah. be interested in getting those names. And, sure. Um, I don't know if everyone is, but maybe I can catch up with you after. That's fine. Yeah. That would be great. Hal Miller, Dorm Brayman, and Molly Boone. Molly Boone. Okay. <laughs> great. Yes? Well, I think we're all really impressed with the progress and the cost efficiencies. I was wondering if there's anything in retrospect that you wish you'd done differently. Right? And we see a lot of success in this story. What, what in retrospect do you think we could have done better? It's a, good, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Okay. It worked so well, and the results were better than anybody anticipated. That it would be hard to say that there was something that we might have done different. I guess I would add one thing. The original site for the Lake City pumping station was in behind the knoll on the, would be the north side of the railroad tracks, what, what is now Burt Gilman. And it had a site that was owned by a fellow named Matthews, interestingly. Uh, it was a mess. He was running a little farm there. He had pigs, cows, and whatnot. It was a mess. The city wanted to get rid of it. And so we bought the site. And uh, then we heard from uh, elected officials that it would make better sense for us to use the site we ended to use and let that newly acquired piece of property be part of the park. So we agreed and, re and redesigned the treatment plant, or excuse me, the pump station. So that, I guess it would have been less uh, obvious and less uh, intrusive into the park had, had we used the first site, but it worked. Yes? Can you talk more about um, the politics between the first vote you mentioned that was not approved right. and getting to the second vote which was approved uh, and those trade-offs you mentioned um, between Seattle and the suburban cities in terms of how, how, that, how that occurred. Well, the, the proponents of Metro, as uh, a Metro at that time, felt it was important to have public transit in the in the uh, quiver, if you will, and area-wide planning, which you could imp use to really direct both transportation planning and wastewater planning. 
And that was an important combination. It would have been a, a great uh, result and probably would have changed the, the uh, outlook of the whole region had it been approved. We had a lot less uh, sprawl, I think. In any event, that, that was the goal. It didn't happen because the urban cities voted heavily against it, particularly Renton, Kent, and Auburn. Uh, they were strong opposition uh, centers, if you will. Uh, in Renton, primarily because of Nick Maffio, the attorney. He was kind of a kook, if I can use that term. Uh, <laughs> we, I'll go, come back to this in a minute. I've got to tell the Nick Maffio story first. Uh, uh, we agree, we, when we signed the contracts with the suburban, well, all of the component agencies, as we called them, uh, we decided that we really had to have one of them tested in the Supreme Court to make sure that it was constitutional. So the Seattle contract was tested, and it went through the Superior Court here before it got to the Supreme Court. In the Superior Court hearing before Judge, uh, uh, I knew his name a minute ago, anyway, the, the local judge at the time, Lloyd Charette, uh, Nick Maffio intervened on the side of the opponents, of course, and the city of Seattle was contesting the, the uh, contract from a, a procedural standpoint. But Nick intervened and truly was opposed to it. And he one time crowed to the judge, he said, Judge, he said, I was third in my class at Harvard. And the judge looked at him and said, I thought the classes were bigger than that. <laughs> uh, anyway, at some point during, during the proceedings, he made a point that was, has some validity to it. And the judge looked at him and said, Mr. Maffio, you finally made a point. And, uh, but that's the kind of guy he was. But. And coming back to the decision, recognizing that Lake Washington truly was the resource that was in danger. These other attributes of a metro would have to come later. They concluded, to, the, again, the proponents concluded that we had to have the basic Lake Washington drainage basin in King County uh, within the proposed boundary and uh, would limit the function to, to wastewater treatment. So that was put to the ballot, as I said, put to the voters in, in September of 58. In the intervening four months there, April to September, Agreements were made with the suburban mayors to agree to buy back or pay for the, uh, the uh, residual cost of facilities they'd built in treatment plants. And uh, then by, from a political standpoint and stewardship standpoint, Mayor Clinton's decision to let Bob Bagley take the credit for that was critical. And he then, as a suburban mayor, could say to his colleagues, look what we've got, and I've got them to agree to it. And so that was a key factor. So the vote, as I said, was successful in both entities, however, not in Renton. Renton was a community that continued to vote against it. I made that comment at a presentation I was part of down at the South Plant several years ago, and the mayor of Renton was there, and I made that comment that shocked the hell out of her. <laughs> she said, why did we do that? And I think the answer was that at that time, Renton had no frontage on the, on the water, on the lake. They had a log boom, a log processing facility where the park is today, the Boeing plant, and that was it. They had no access to the lake and didn't identify with it. Today they, they do, and of course, very proud to be a part of the organization that's cleaned up that situation. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anything more? Yes? Um, one other thing about politics uh, that um, those two uh, uh, efforts was, I think the first slide you said about the first uh, ordinance or initiative included water supply. I thought uh, it was one of the six one of the six functions that a metro could have right. performed. So I was just curious how that fell away or what you know, if you could speak to the We had a at the time I think everyone realized we, we had and still have a great regional water system and there was no political support for changing the, the management and the ownership of that. I think that was probably the decision process. I wasn't there at the time. I didn't get here until three months later. Yes. More? I wanted to find out about the opponents. Did they eventually come around after your success and say, you know, they were in the wrong? Yeah. I think some did. You know, a success story has very, very, uh, a lot of uh, authors, a lot of parents. And uh, so I think a lot of people realize that. It's like the ballpark. I can't find anybody now who voted against the ballpark. Uh, but uh, the, I'll call it the far right wing political Spectrum did not uh, agree. Uh, that, that same Eastside developer and his son opposed the uh, 
the forward thrust actions and still oppose public transit. So uh, it's, it's there in their blood, <laughs> in their genes. Uh, I mentioned the uh, John Burt Society. Uh, the day after I took office, there had been an article in the paper about Fred leaving and my taking over. Next morning I got a call, it came right through my phone, through the switchboard. <clears throat> a woman answered her and I said hello. She said, in a voice that was just dripping in sarcasm, she said, Mr. Gibbs, I want to make sure you know where the red phone is so you can take your orders from Moscow. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Anything more? Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the organization and what it looked like when it first started? Because you guys had so much success. Were, were the engineers, the metropolitan engineers, a completely separate entity? How did that, how did yeah. that relate with staff we, and then also the council? We had a very small staff. Uh, probably weren't more than 10 of us uh, on the staff. And all the work, all the engineering, design work, construction management was done by Metropolitan Engineers. We shared the same office. We had an upstairs uh, office over a tailor shop on Denny Way, 152 Denny Way. The building's gone now. But that was it. Uh, and uh, the design work was done there, and the uh, management from Metro standpoint was done there. Uh, a little later, the engineers built a building at 410 West Harrison Street, still there, and, and we moved down there. They took a one floor and we had a floor for, for Metro itself. By that time, we'd developed a small engineering staff to do uh, uh, small projects internally. And we housed the, uh, the first water quality lab there. It was a one-room lab, uh, quite different from what you have out on the ship canal now. And uh, okay, that was about it. That's where the the uh, data was fed in from the water quality monitoring stations along the Duwamish. We had a, a big readout facility there, attracted some attention from a press standpoint. But it was a very small operation, uh, close-knit. Uh, I think most people would have found it hard to uh, identify which label they were wearing, whether it was Metro or Metropolitan Engineers. But it worked very well. It was basically what the transit industry does routinely is to have a a uh, consortium or a general consulting engineer take over and manage the project. First time it had been done in, in my recollection in this particular field though. Yes, yes. Do you have any thoughts on some of the current uh, issues in wastewater and nutrient removal, micro pollutants, uh, direct potable reuse, do you have any thoughts on any of those types of things? We couldn't have done the job if we had, had those, those considerations to deal with. At the time we built the treatment plants, people were only concerned about uh, dissolved oxygen, BOD, and sediment, or uh, solids removal. That was it. And it wasn't until quite a bit later, uh, although I was still there, that people recognized, and we recognized, that uh, some of the heavy metals in the residual biosolids were a problem. And so we started to be concerned about that. But some of the concerns you deal with now are just off the scale from the standpoint of what we had to deal with. Yes. Um, just want to get your reflection on a couple of things. So what I love about your story is probably in the beginning of you know, working in this region on wastewater, people didn't take the work we do for granted as much as they do now. And so it just made me wonder, like, how did you get interested in the business? Did you grow up here and try and swim in Lake Washington? Did you move here and <laughs> just decide this was the gem of a place to get started in this kind of infrastructure? And just, I'm just curious about your personal sort of... Yeah, thing. Interesting question. Uh, good story. Uh, my dad was a civil engineer, uh, had his own practice down in Cowles and Lewis counties. Uh, Gibbs and Holton engineers, still there, although long, he's gone, gone. Uh, so I grew up without ever giving any thought to whether I, what I was going to do. I was going to be an engineer. And so I uh, went to school here, UW, and I, joined the, I was pulled into the Air Force for a couple of years, and then I joined the state. Uh, as I was getting out of the Air Force, Dad pointed out to me that there was a job opening at the Pollution Control Commission. So I applied for that. And I had gotten to know the consulting firm that Dad used for anything that was technical in his business, Stevens and Thompson Runyon out of Portland. So I applied there because I knew those folks well, and I liked highway work. Uh, moving dirt was interesting to me. So, <laughs> so I applied to the highway department. I had three job offers, a consulting engineering firm in Portland, uh, the highway department in Raymond, and the Pollution Control Commission. And I selected the latter because it paid $50 a month more. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, 
And so that exposed me to the, to the whole process, of course. Uh, I, I've always been a tree hugger anyway, so that, that was an easy transition to make. And that, that as I said, was the uh, process by which I fell into this opportunity. Anything more? Yes? I wanted to find out, how did you go about recruiting and training the operators for the plants? Oh, good point. Uh, under the legislation, enabling legislation, we were obligated to take all of the operators from the old plants that we were abandoning. And of course, we had to operate them for several years before they could be abandoned. So uh, we, we got to know the operator very well. They were actually shifted their, their pay responsibilities from Kirkland or wherever to us. So we knew them all. We, we needed more than uh, were available from that reservoir. So we went out and, re and recruited. There was an operator school in Walla Walla, I think it was at the time, and we took the graduating class there two or three years in a row and uh, picked up uh, some people who were well-known in the industry, locally, I mean regionally, excuse me, and uh, they led the effort. Uh, uh, Chuck Henry from the city of Seattle became our director of operations and came over and did that. Uh, Ted Mallory from the city of Seattle Engineering Department came over. Um, we picked up a fellow named Ralph Buckland who managed the, uh, who had been in Walla Walla and managed the Renton plant for a while. So that was the basis for getting the, the uh, staff on board. We had to train them. Uh, interesting story relative to the, uh, the old treatment plants we took over. Once the cities realized that the plants were going to be abandoned and they were no longer going to be responsible for them, they quit maintaining them. And so when we took over the plants, we had a lot of deferred maintenance to take on just because they had to operate for a number of years before they could be abandoned. And particularly the northern plants along the east side intercept, they were going to operate until 1967, 68. So there was work to do there. And in that process, again, we got to know the, the operators, work with them, and give them some training on that basis. But that's, how, that's how it evolved. More? <laughs> yes. You mentioned that there was a monitor station in the Yes. Where that was? We had uh, five of them. We put one upstream from the Renton plant discharge. These were, uh, we put in submersible pumps uh, that floated in a uh, donut like device on the river, pumped into a little facility on the shore. So we put one there, we put one at, at uh, where was it? East Marginal Way, the bridge there. But one at 16th Avenue South, one at 1st Avenue South. I guess there were four of them. No, five, anyway. Those, that data was collected, telemetered into uh, the central facility, and that gave us a, a record of dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, to a temperature, two or three other parameters that were important to know at that time from the standpoint of protecting the river. Yes? So on this, back to this 58 comp plan that was um, approved a month after the engineering consortium was, was convened, and you said it was prepared over two years. Who was funding that work before Metro was, the boat was approved, and who was directing that work? It was uh, funded primarily by the state. I've forgotten their per share, probably three quarters of the cost, uh, City of Seattle and King County, all three. And the, uh, the effort was managed by the Department of Ecology, and they selected Brown and Caldwell to do the study. And Brown and Caldwell hired Hal Miller, who was then a regional water quality director in the San Diego region and for California, to come up and manage the project. He did a great job, and he, as I said, he was a magnificent man, a great mentor and a great uh, teacher. Anything more? I'm going to outwear my welcome here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.